This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. Good evening, my name is Jacinta Thompson and I'm the Executive Director and Events and Exhibitions Producer of the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre. I would like to acknowledge that the University of South Australia meets on the land of the Kaurna people. We wish to express our respect for the Kaurna people, their elders and ancestors and acknowledge the spiritual and cultural relationship the Kaurna people have with their traditional land. I extend that respect to Aboriginal peoples from other areas of South Australia and Australia. I would like to welcome you all on behalf of the Hawke Centre and the University of South Australia to our In Conversation with Professor John Keane, one of Australia's top thinkers and writers on democracy. This event is presented as part of Just a Thought, an exclusive In Conversation series presented by the Hawke Centre with journalist Tori Shepherd. This event is being recorded and a video will be available on the Hawke Centre website. We encourage you to bring this to the attention of friends and colleagues who could not join us online tonight. I'm sure you will find this an insightful and fascinating conversation as we mark the United Nations International Day of Democracy. It is now my pleasure to introduce Professor John Keane and Tori Shepherd. Thank you. Professor John Keane. Happy International Day of Democracy. Yeah, hello, Tori. I'm, I'm very glad to be with you uh, in Adelaide. And um, here I am uh, in a kind of quarantine zone uh, in Sydney. Uh, and um, yes, why don't we talk about democracy and what's going on and whether it has a future or not? Big questions. Might just start out with something smaller, like who you are. So you're a professor of politics at the University of Sydney. Yeah. You're a prolific author. You have many book titles based around the theme of democracy and, and civil society. I saw somewhere that people have declared you one of our greatest intellectual exports, which seems very like a very nice thing for somebody to say. But we are going to... That was actually Philip Adams. Was it? <laughs> yes. And so it must be true. It must be true. Um, we're mostly... A lot of today we're going to sort of spring off from your latest book, The New Despotism, which uh, is a fascinating roller coaster ride um and i also just wanted to say hey it's only when we first spoke that i found out you're actually from south australia i am i was uh born on a farm at the end of the adelaide airport runway that farm doesn't exist anymore but i grew up um at the end the runway on the gulf of st vincent uh we had horses and sheep and dairy cows and we had um immigrants uh, who lived with us, who grew tomatoes and cucumbers for the Adelaide market. Um, and it all came to a crashing end when I was 11 because we were compulsorily uh, kicked off the land to extend the runway. It's very the castle. It is. Um, it's possible the castle was actually, you know, uh, drawn from, from our case. But uh, yeah, I'm a very proud uh, South Australian and I um, uh, have in my writing, I've tried to say things about South Australia. I wrote a history of democracy, a big fat book of a thousand pages, and there there are some um, stories in there. For example, that women won the right to vote and and the right to stand, which uh, didn't. It's it's a complicated history. Yeah, yeah, but it happened first in South Australia, and I tell the story of of how it happened. Uh, so here I am. Excellent. Well, look, thank you again for joining us. So let's start off with the new despotism. I mean, you've got to pick up a book called that, right? Uh, and yeah, I call it the little green book. Um, there you go, the little green book. Yeah. So when but most people think of despots, they think of tin, tin pot dictators, you know, Kim Jong-un. Um, they think of these people in, you know, hermit nations or people from, from history. But what you're arguing is actually, I guess, that there's a bit of a false binary between democracy and despotism, and there's a whole gray area in between. So talk us through 
bear in mind what people might automatically think of with despotism, what you're talking about in the new despotism. Well, I, th I think to, to begin, uh, Tori, I think you, you put your finger on uh, a very key point, which is that when you look at the way journalists and, and others um, portray, uh, you know, Putin or Xi Jinping or Kim Jong-un or Erdogan in Turkey, they think of them as despots. Um, very often they call them autocrats. Uh, and there's a sort of sensational treatment of them, you know, that they're kind of power drunk and um, they're reckless and they don't care for uh, their subject populations. And, you know, they're just wild cards. Uh, and so what attracts um, this kind of storytelling is, for instance, that I describe this in the book, uh, Putin has a food taster because he's... Uh, he fears assassination. Or when Kim Jong-un goes traveling uh, outside of North Korea, his feces and urine are bagged and sent back under high security uh, conditions. Or... Oh, don't, don't leave that there. <laughs> or... Um, or Why? Lukashenko, because he's paranoid about, <laughs> um, uh, you know, body testing and, um, and rumors that, you know, could be circulated inside and, and beyond North Korea that, you know, he's dying or he's got some, you know, uh, uh, serious disease. Or one last example, Lukashenko, uh, who is... Very topical. ...some um, trouble at the moment in Belarus. Um, a very successful despotism with a despot at the top you know, he attracts media attention because he says all this talk about um, the pestilence is just hysteria. I mean, you should go to the sauna more often, he tells his subject, and drink more vodka. You know, so the impression is created that these are kind of crazy uh, regimes, you know, led by power-hungry despots. What I tried to do in this book um, and I tried to write it as beautifully as possible um, with, with um, lots of examples, is to show that actually the new despotisms, the Turkeys, Vietnam, China, Russia, Saudi, Singapore, Belarus, are whip smart. That is, those who rule uh, build in to their state institutions, learning mechanisms, because they're aware that foolish decisions, that recklessness, you know, can bring like a house of cards, it can bring the whole regime tumbling to the ground because it loses uh, uh, popular support. And so uh, the book details, and this is one of the really vital things for why, it's, why these are new regimes. They're not like Zimbabwe under Mugabe, you know, violent, thuggish, ruled by the fist, with no care at all for the bulk of the population. The new despotisms build in these learning mechanisms. So, for example, um, in uh, the Emirates, they have a happiness program. They have happiness forums uh, located throughout the system where people are encouraged to tell the rulers, you know, where, where to what extent they're happy or why are they unhappy? Um, the Singaporeans have been practicing, the Singaporean one-party uh, government has been practicing uh, what's called the REACH program. And there are teachings and stakeholder meetings. Um, in China, uh, the internet is used to, to build uh, public forums. For example, in Guangzhou, where um, citizens are encouraged you know, to speak to the party about their concerns about traffic and environment and so on. So these are uh, regimes that try to be resilient. Uh, we can perhaps talk uh, in a moment about their, their weak points, but they try to um, build in learning mechanisms and those who rule do so using um, techniques like elections. Uh, which are learning mechanisms, you know, that they, they can find out the degree of, of, uh, of popular support for, for their regimes, and it gives them a chance to, to show off. 
And one last comment, uh, Tori. Th these despotisms, I call them phantom democracies. You know, those who rule do everything they do is in the name of the people. They have the gall to describe themselves as democracies, as truer democracies. Putin says it repeatedly. Erdogan says, you know, we have a higher form of democracy in Turkey. Uh, and so um, these are smart despotisms whose rulers um, act as if they're democracies. And in my view, they are a serious alternative to power sharing constitutional democracies, say, of the Australian type. Which is a fairly frightening thought, to be honest. Is it that because they can, you know, they're not sending soldiers through the streets massacring their own people, they've kind of put a veneer of, of charm and, as you say, the phantom democratic veneer over what they're doing. Does that make them more dangerous than a Mugabe type regime? Yes, because, um, for instance, on the question of violence, ultimately, uh, these are regimes that, that rule through the fist. But um, the bulk of the population, certainly the middle classes, all of these despotisms have a middle class. The, de the middle classes don't feel fear. They don't um, fear you know, a knock on their door at dawn or after midnight. That's not normal. Those who resist, of course, are, are subject to targeted violence. Um, violence in these despotisms comes stocking masked. Um, they practice the technique. This is the phrase I use in the book. It's a Chinese proverb. They, they kill chickens to scare monkeys. You know, so uh, let's take the case of Alexei, um, uh, uh, the, the opposition leader in uh, Russia, who has just probably been poisoned. Um, the way Putin's Russia deals with opponents uh, is that's typical. You know, um, it's, it's, uh, it's done by uh, usually balaclava-masked, um, camouflage-dressed uh, thugs. Um, the regime says, you know, this is terrible what has happened, and we will be looking, you know, for the perpetrators, and we will bring them to justice. Usually nothing happens. Uh, and so these regimes are police states, but they don't feel like police states uh, for the bulk of the population. It's again another source of their resilience, and it makes them, um, I would say, more terrifying mm. because of their ability to um, produce what I call voluntary servitude. You know, they, these are regimes, despotisms that practice the art of trying to win the loyalty of their powerless subjects, and they feed upon complacency. Well, as soon as you um, said that about, about kill the chickens to scare the monkeys, I immediately thought of the Uyghurs and how China has locked up you a million people in internment camps, called them re-education centres. Does that then just allow the rest of the populace to compartmentalise, to sort of put that to one side as they go about their normal daily lives? It gives them, it gives them an excuse not to have to become a revolutionary or not to have to challenge the regime. Yes, I think that's certainly true. Um, were it not for investigative journalists, we wouldn't know about the fate of uh, the Uyghurs in uh, Xinjiang. Uh, meanwhile, the bulk of the Chinese population, um, thanks to uh, state-controlled media uh, and with private platforms uh, like WeChat, uh, there is censorship. So the bulk of the population are uh, very fine. Um, Chinese uh, people, um, I have many friends who are like this, who know very little or nothing about what is going on in, uh, uh, in Xinjiang. So there's, there's, there's simply a blanking out. There's a silencing of uh, a pretty serious issue. And once again, were it not for investigative journalists, um, including, say, the BBC, uh, some German... Uh, a journey and so on. We would not know um, the scale of, of this so-called re-education uh, program and it's, uh, it's undoubtedly 
a, a, a strategy of diluting uh, the population. It's a form of religious ethnic cleansing uh, on a very vast scale. But it gives, I guess, Xi Jinping plausible deniability, doesn't it? I mean, he can stand up in international forums and he can tell his people, uh, and he can stand, I mean, I, I personally had a visit from um, some CCP, some Communist Party members to my workplace after I'd written about the Uyghurs, just saying, oh, you've been tricked by the fake news sort of thing. So it gives, you know, they, they can hold their heads high in a sense because they have a bunch of protective phrases that they can use, which they couldn't if they had soldiers in the streets. Yes. Um, the, all of these despotisms, not just the Chinese, um, practice the art of gaslighting uh, their, their subject populations. Uh, they spread stories um, that are, are often untrue. Uh, there's a lot of bullshit. Um, there is um, what I call in the book uh, kind of vaudeville performance. You know, vaudeville, say in the 1920s, was a, a, a type of entertainment where you had jugglers and dancers and, you know, fire eaters and animals and so on. Something for everybody. Um, these are media-saturated regimes, really state-of-the-art, um, in which um, there's a lot of circulation officially of stories that, that have a kind of disorientating effect on people, that entertain uh, people, that encourage people to say, to draw the conclusion, ah, you know, it's all politics, I um, don't care, it doesn't affect my life, uh, what do I know? And when that happens on a large scale, to do, for example, with the fate of the Uyghurs or to do with um, the fate of dissidents in Russia. Uh, you know, th that works um, to the advantage of, of these regimes. And it, it sort of, it, it puts me in mind of juveniles bred in circuses, you know, as long as their stomachs are full and they've got something to look at, they're not gonna worry too much about what's going on behind the scenes. But as soon as you say bullshit, gaslighting and vaudeville, of course, my brain went straight to US President Donald Trump. And now America is a democracy. Um, and yet that populism seems to be a bit of a, a crossover with the new despotism where you've got a president who can stand up and say things that are patently untrue. Um, and he can talk directly to his followers as he as he's well known to do on on Twitter. So where does where does the US fit into that um, idea of kind of fooling the masses, keeping them entertained, while actually carrying out attacks against democracy? I think um, we should all be concerned, if not alarmed, about what is going on in the United States. You know, um, since uh, 1945, uh, it was a democratic empire after 1989-91. It was, uh, it was, you know, it was a unipolar world in which um, the United States, you know, operated on the presumption with the reputation of it being the world's most powerful democracy. And what I say in the New Despotism book is that towards the end in particular is that there are a lot of trends going on in the United States, but in other democracies that have a striking resemblance to life under these new despotisms. For example, um, the gaslighting uh, by governments and of politicians, that there's no doubt that that is um, that systematic in the new despotism. Mm -hmm. And it's a very dangerous trend where uh, when a politician says that's fake news, that politician, typically a man, will actually means by that, uh, I don't agree with you, and you don't agree with me, therefore I call you fake. But this is, this is a destruction of, um, of truth and uh, of honesty, of integrity in journalism. But there are other trends. Um, all of these despotisms, it sounds strange to say, given their resilience, all of them have a big gap between rich and poor. That gap has been growing in uh, actually existing democracies for, for 40 years. And then comes the populism question. So for reasons that are quite complicated, uh, I'm, I'm sure you're aware that um, it's public disaffection with parties and 
politicians and parliaments and politics. It's public disaffection that has made the new populist, populist attractive. You know, it's, it's not just number 45, as I call him. I don't use his name anymore. And it's my way of remaining optimistic. You know, there might be a 46th, might. Uh, but it's not only just number 45, it's Bolsonaro, uh, it's, um, uh, it's, of course, Johnson and co. in uh, the United Kingdom, it's Marie Le Pen in, in France. You know, the list uh, uh, grows. And this new populism, Modi in India, I have just finished a book um, with an Indian colleague on what is going on in India. India is a very good example of this new populism under Modi. Uh, it's a more general trend. So what happens and why it is that democracies are vulnerable to despotism is that a party springs up that is against the establishment and it talks the language of the people and it says the system is rotten. They begin to win elections and when they do get elected to office, they then begin to uh, form pacts with usually their rich friends, or they build a dynasty, have you noticed, uh, in, in the United States. It's a sort of family-run operation. I think six out of 12 speakers at the convention were Trumps. <laughs> sure, you can trust them. They don't <laughs> cause any problem. Uh, blood and money, you know, are mixed together. And what's dangerous about the new populism in action is that it not only uh, produces demagogues, you know, the people is a kind of fiction, you know, as a category. So you need a figure who embodies the people, and that's the demagogue. It's the Bolsonaros and the Edoyans, and it's uh, the, the number 45s. And that um, mixture of a populist party, a populist government with a demagogue, begins to tamper with... Um, the, the public monitoring accountability institutions. So you can see these trends that are now well advanced in the United States. They pick fights with the judiciary and they try to stack the judiciary in their favor. They do not want rule of law. They do not want um, uh, legal accountability. They attack um, all media platforms uh, that are hostile to them, call them fake news. Uh, typically, this is going on in the United States, um, they tamper with uh, the expertise of, of uh, the civil service, of, of public service institutions. Um, they, tame, they tame the legislature so that a dynamic begins to unfold in which you have the centralization and concentration of power and you have the weakening of um, accountability mechanisms. Well, um, it's clear to me that that is the recipe for building a despotism in the name of the people using elections and calling it um, democratic. When number 45 um, quite recently said, maybe I want more than four years, maybe 12 years, that I think is a very um, serious warning sign. It should set off alarm bells. Uh, it was Putin-esque, I would have said. <laughs> yes, and that, so, so running through the book is the idea that we should not think about um, democracy and despotism in terms of, um, you know, good guys and bad guys. Uh, it's not, these are not binary opposites, as you said at the beginning. These are not, um, you know, uh, uh, entirely different sets of regimes. What we're witnessing is uh, a strange dynamic in which the despotisms claim to be democratic and have a kind of democratic feel to them. Uh, at least three quarters of Chinese people, when interviewed reliably, say they live in a democracy. And on the other hand, we have democracies um, that are showing many signs, many symptoms of despotism. And um, part of the book, uh, a key aim of the book, is that it's a precautionary tale about our times. It's an attempt to make sense of these confusing dynamics in defense of democracy, I should say.
<laughs> yeah, we should make we should make that very clear. <laughs> well, yeah. um, you don't talk much about Australia in the book, but what I took away from it was exactly your warning about when these symptoms appear, we have to see them for, for what they are. And immediately you can see th things like the questioning of authority. You know, the, um, there are politicians, not all of them, of course, but certainly on the back bench of the coalition, and certainly within One Nation, um, who basically revile anyone with expertise because, you know, you should trust your common sense. It should just be what, what every man thinks sort of thing. So don't worry about the scientists. Don't worry about the, um, you know, logical premises leading to a logical conclusion. Do you, what, what are you worried about in Australia at the moment? What symptoms of this sort of despotism can you see? Well, I think that um, uh, there are two points, Tori. I think the, the first has to do with expertise and the, and the importance of expertise in a democracy. Um, it's true that all of the new populists, you know, who claim to be making politics in the name of the people, of the authentic people, all of these new populists express uh, reservations, often are outright hostile to expertise, for example, in the public service uh, institutions. Um, and I think that that is part of the institutional uh, takeover. That is part of the dismantling process, uh, the dismantling of democracy. It's very dangerous for power sharing uh, democracy. And it ignores that expertise is really, really important in a democracy. What is an expert? Well, once upon a time, for example, in the 19th century, the expert was considered to be a kind of replacement for the priest or perhaps God. You know, scientific knowledge knows the truth of things. Uh, it was in the 1930s that um, someone named Niels Bohr, who was one of the founders, the key founders of, of quantum, uh, the quantum revolution that happened in the sciences, uh, wrote about experts, and I very much agree with this uh, sentiment, uh, where he said, you know, in the past we've thought of experts as, as kind of, um, you know, godlike um, know-alls. But actually, uh, we know now that, you know, knowledge is contestable and, you know, truth has many faces. But the true expert, uh, Niels Bohr said, is someone whose experience the words share a common root, experience and expert, whose experience um, makes them wise, who remind their colleagues that they don't know everything and remind people of power that they don't know everything. So the true expert is someone who warns um, about the folly, um, the, the hubris of, 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 of powerful people, warns them to keep their feet on the ground, um, to, to be more cautious about things. So on, on the question of Australia, well, uh, in the New Despotism book, uh, towards the end, I raised the question of how are uh, democracies like Australia going to deal with these despotisms? You know, that's a very live question. How, how, do, we, how do we deal with um, uh, Xi, Jinping, Xi Jinping's China? How do we deal with Putin's Russia? How do we deal with the Saudis? How do we deal with um, uh, the Turkish uh, regime under Erdogan? And I say that, um, well, we can contemplate military action, extremely dangerous and very unwise. We could um, push for a new Cold War. There are, there's every sign that that's beginning to happen. The pressure is coming from Washington, and if number 45 is re-elected, uh, we're certainly going to uh, experience more of that. Um, one of the warnings running through this book, it may sound shocking to listeners and viewers, is that we might lose that Cold War, um, because not to be underestimated is the resilience of uh, these new despotisms. Um, the pack is, of course, led by China. Uh, just building something like a global empire, and it has a definite attractiveness in different parts of the world. So to come to the point, the question is, you know, will trade sanctions work? Probably not, uh, or not be very effective. 
the argument of the book is that the most effective thing um, elected representatives and, and citizens living in democracies can do is to clean up the Algian stables. Algian stables, what does that mean? You know, um, the Greeks uh, uh, spoke about, uh, told the story of King Algius, who had several thousand oxen and didn't get around to cleaning the stables for over 30 years. So there was quite a lot of, shall we say, excrement. And, it, and, and so Hercules came in and redirected a river to clean up um, uh, all of that excrement. And in the book, I say that the most powerful thing, the most effective thing is to kind of um, ramp up the resilience of, of democracies um, so that they become more robust, so that um, citizens feel more trusting of those who govern and so on. Um, how to do it? Well, I have a long shopping list of possible reforms, uh, which I think um, the Hawke Centre uh, is known to be sympathetic uh, uh, towards, and I think um, uh, uh, these reforms are certainly unfinished business, whoever governs uh, in Australia. For instance, <clears throat> um, we have several million permanent residents who do not have the right to vote. We know that um, a couple of hundred thousand young people are still missing from the electoral rolls in a country uh, famous for its compulsory voting. We have no National Anti-Corruption Commission. It's a scandal. Uh, we have no um, adequate, as things stand, representation for our indigenous peoples. Uh, we have no protection of public service broadcasting. Uh, the list goes on, you know, that for me is a short list of important institutional reforms that would make this a much more resilient, um, robust uh, democracy. And it seems to me in the face of fears about what is going on in the United States, you know, is it a failing state? Is democracy dying in the United States? These are serious questions. And in the face of you know, dealing with our main trade partner, China. Uh, I think I think the resilience, the vitality, you know, the the, the kind of liveliness that would come from these reforms um, is very important. I think they're really uh, what's needed. And on your list, where does the media sit? Because, you know, theoretically, the fourth estate is a conduit between the rulers and the people, um, you know, Ideally, journalism is afflicting the comfortable and <laughs> comforting the afflicted, but, but trust has become a major issue, which politicians have helped to, I guess, tarnish that trust by calling out fake news for anything that they don't like. But how does the media work in, I'm not specifically talking about Australia now, but under the new despots? Well, it's a very good question. You know, there is, um, we all know there is um, um, historic, uh, communications revolution going on. It's unfinished. It began probably in the 50s and 60s. It's the digital networking of information flows and a lot of positive things uh, that have come from this. The fact that we can do uh, by Zoom, you know, a face-to-face -face meeting where time and space barriers are simply overcome is, is one of the advantages of this communications revolution. Uh, that we couldn't have done in the age of the telephone or in the age of television or in the age of the letter or in the age of the printing press. Um, what's interesting about these new despotisms, Tori, is that they are all media saturated. They are all caught up in, these, uh, in this unfinished communications revolution. And they can be read, as I tried to do in the book, as efforts by states um, together with um, private corporate media platforms. They can be read as efforts to um, harness this unfinished communications revolution. And of course, they practice censorship. You know, web, uh, web platforms are struck down. And of course, they pump out a lot of, you know, gaslighting um, uh, reportage. All that goes on. But what is strange about these new despotisms is that they allow a measure 
of what I call digital mutinies. They allow um, protest, belly aching, um, letting off steam in public. Uh, you can see this dynamic on WeChat. You know, it's it's the it's the main medium, main social media uh, platform. Uh, every day, there are literally hundreds of disputes that go on where someone, um, you, you know, uh, takes news and and recycles it. An ordinary Wang Min, they're called, an ordinary netizen, um, and shares it with others. And so, what can happen? and it happens uh, regularly, is that there is some trouble caused to local officials. For instance, um, believe it or not, I, uh, in August of last year, I was teaching a uh, summer school in Wuhan. Oh. And I made it out of Wuhan. Uh, here I am, still healthy. Um, just before I arrived, there was an incident. This is very typical in China. It happens under all of the desperate systems where a woman driving a very fancy car parked her car at a strange angle on a main downtown street to go and get a coffee, caused a ginormous traffic jam, lots of honking. When she came out, um, very well-dressed, obviously um, middle, upper middle class, uh, people are shouting at her and she shouts back at um, drivers saying, you know, you are all rubbish. It's all filmed. Um, very quickly, it's learned that she is married to the district police uh, commissioner. And so questions are then raised about their wealth. You know, where did she get this Porsche car that she is driving? Uh, and before you know it, um, that police commissioner is dismissed. You know, so there are these power conflicts that go on within uh, the new despotism. They're not totalitarian regimes. Uh, it's part of their whip smart resilience that they try to um, have uh, built into the system, you know, these, these early warning uh, detector mechanisms. And it's something to be understood, uh, not to be praised, but to be understood. And I think that um, in this respect, one of the weak points of these despotisms is the potential resistance that comes from what I call digital mutinies. Sometimes they rock the whole system. For example, uh, there was that moment at the beginning of this great pestilence, at the end of December and early January of this year, out of Wuhan, where doctors began to attract, you know, through WeChat, large um, uh, numbers of followers, basically pointing out that there was um, a cover-up going on and that this was an extremely dangerous virus that was dealt with uh, in a despotic way subsequently. But this, this um, you know, if democracy is to have a future, then there has to be multiple platforms um, that have a public service quality about them, where uh, platforms where citizens and representatives can, can circulate stories um, that uh, and bring to account, bring to heel um, powerful people uh, who have abused their power. That, as I see it, is, you know, it comes very uh, close to the core of what democracy is. Democracy is a way of handling power that is opposed to bullying and manipulation, uh, that is against the foolishness of those. Um, the outright stupidity of those who become blinded by their own power. Uh, that's why we have periodic elections. But thanks to this unfinished communications revolution, I think that contestation of power, that bringing to heel, that attempt to inject public accountability into power relations, you know, exposés of domestic violence, exposés of what is happening in senior citizens' residences during a pestilence. You know, the role of journalism in its hybrid um, forms with citizens and, and official platform, the role is to expose those kinds of things because no democracy uh, can indefinitely allow um, the abuse um, of power which is monopolized. So um, that is a long, long-winded way of saying that 
platforms like the Hawke Center, like the ABC, um, uh, uh, WhatsApp groups, um, uh, platforms that operate globally. I mean, these are all very important to preserve and uh, to defend. One of the key dangers of the new despotisms is that they try to eliminate all platforms, media platforms, um, that don't share uh, the ruling power's way of thinking. Which brings, can I just bring that back then to the digital mutinies? Because it seems to me in China that maybe it acts as a sort of, um, you know, like a, like a safety valve. Like just let them have their little, their little mutiny over here, but it's quite controlled. And if we didn't let them have that little thing, the whole thing might go. And it reminded me of um, Extinction Rebellion protests here in Australia, where it's, you know, if you're going to protest in Australia, you have to apply for permission, you have to talk to the police, you can do it at these hours um, and not actually disrupt anyone else. And Extinction Rebellion you know, caused massive disruption. Yep. And it seemed to me there was a real intolerance revealed there to civil disobedience, that protest has to be, protest mutinies have to be kept in, you know, a, an enclosed bubble. Yes, I mean, if if I'm right that um, we're living through a Shakespearean moment, you know, a big historical transition where uh, there's a lot of um, disorder and chaos, a lot of things are happening that are utterly surprising or that nobody really thought could happen. If I'm right about that, and I would say that there are growing, uh, there's a growing perception among millions of people that these times are not normal. Very big things are going on after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the rise of China, the, the emergence of a belligerent Russia, um, uh, and now a pestilence that is disordering uh, things and causing great uncertainty. If I'm right about that, then I think uh, it, it, it follows that uh, complacency. Um, I don't care about all of those that lot. You know, they're all, they're all thieves and crooks. You know, that, that kind of, oh, I don't care. I've got better things to do. Um, let's have a beer uh, or a glass of wine. Uh, you know, that complacency, if, if I'm right, um, in this country uh, is not very durable. Uh, it is quite probable, I think, that although this is not a rerun of the 1920s and 30s, it's as big as that. Um, there are very big things going on, and the two biggest things going on is the breakdown of American democracy and the rise of a confident, dignified China um, that is making global gains. And as a medium-sized power with a great democratic tradition, um, a lot of good spirit and goodwill among uh, people, Australia, I think um, Australians will have to become more political. I mean, uh, start paying attention, more attention to public affairs and not just what goes on locally or in your state or in the Federation, but beyond because I think um, no ship uh, of democracy is, is, is going to be able to just uh, behave as if it's in calm uh, doldrum waters. I think the, you, we, we're already beginning to feel the, you know, the rocking. And I suspect that's not going to go away. We don't have a crystal ball. We don't know what the future will be. But um, judging by current day trends and projecting into the future, it seems to me that um, citizen complacency is uh, unhealthy for a democracy and it's unwise in this period. I think there's a really nice analogy in there between complacency about the actual pandemic itself, about the virus. You know, some people go, oh, bugger, I'm young enough, I'll survive it, I'm just going to go and, you know, go to a nightclub and hug all my mates. Yep. Not realising 
the, um, the, the ripple effect of, of what they do then. And then, as you say, complacency about international affairs, our place in the world, and where we're getting well, I'm, I'm, I'm not the only one hoping that, uh, Tori, that, that, um, that the way we've handled this pestilence uh, is quite impressive by global standards. I mean, understandably, uh, we're collectively panicking about what has happened in Victoria. But, you know, as I speak, uh, there were uh, yesterday a thousand new cases in the United Kingdom, um, 10,000 in Florida. And, you know, we're, we're really exercised by now around 150 uh, a day. Well, that's not a justification for complacency, but the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, we've, we've handled this with a good measure of, of solidarity among citizens. A lot of common sense has kicked in. Um, we did close our borders um, and uh, we are practicing physical distancing and so on. And we're zooming closer uh, together. And that surely is an opportunity for a democracy in this pestilence to come out stronger in a region that itself has come out stronger. You know, the, the, the United States um, is a basket case in this matter of the pestilence. Europe has been very badly damaged. Latin America, um, you know, it's a terrible dynamic. Africa, similarly. So, you know, we have um, a wealthy country that um, uh, has a, a lot of goodwill, uh, that, that has uh, managed to um, almost get on top of this pestilence. And that's, you know, that's a huge advantage in political economy terms, in terms of, you know, making the democracy more resilient, I think. It may be that a third spike, you know, um, as happened in the so-called Spanish flu after, during and immediately after World War I, the third spike was the worst. Uh, we should pay attention to that. We should not pin all of our hopes on um, vaccine, but remaining resilient, um, uh, in which democracy plays a very important role, is what we learned from the Taiwanese or the South Koreans uh, and New Zealand. You know, all of them democracies that have actually handled this with um, good leadership and intelligence and solidarity among citizens. The opposite is, of course, um, what has been unfolding in the United States. Poor leadership, gaslighting, um, no coordination of federal and state governments, um, citizens insisting, many citizens insisting that you know, their rights to liberty are really threatened, you know, and they've got to end the lockdown. Uh, and look at what is going on you know, by the time of the election on November the 3rd quite possibly a quarter of a million Americans uh, will have died unnecessarily. That's a, that ought to be a scandal uh, in, um, in democracies, and it rather calls into question the belief that those who currently govern are making America great again. It, it may indeed cast some doubt on that claim. Um, now, I just, I'm just going to jump back a bit, because we've talked about gaslighting quite a bit. And, you know, that, of course, comes from a, a famous film. But I just I want to read out your definition of gaslighting because I, I just saw it in my notes and realised we might have, have explained it. You try to gas, you're trying to gaslight me or something. I, I am. This is... <laughs> All right. Let's try. This is a meta gaslight about gaslighting. Yeah. Um, so gaslighting cuts much more deeply into daily life. It's the organised effort to mess with subjects' identities, to deploy entertainment, conflicting stories, lies, bullshit and silence for the purpose of sowing the seeds of doubt and confusion among subjects in order to control them fully and durably. The point is to drown subjects in shit, to flood their lives with gaseous excrement. I just thought that was a very graphic... Did I, did I actually write that? You did write that. <laughs> I, I would never use a rude word, John. I'm literally just reading... <laughs> um, I feel as though that gaslighting, though, it is at, at the heart of all of this. But at the same time as leaders are gaslighting their subjects, don't the subjects have to be kind of complicit in that? I mean, 
as I mentioned before, about the people in China sort of blissfully unaware, but also happy to remain unaware. Is that like, you know, human psychology doesn't really like to deal with difficult things. And so in some ways we enable our leaders to gaslight us. Yeah, it's a really, really important point, um, Tori. And uh, in the New Despotism book, I pay quite a lot of attention to um, the kind of micro dynamics, you know, what goes on uh, in everyday life in terms of how people live their lives and why they are prepared to give themselves away to those regimes. Um, you know, how does voluntary servitude happen? And in the book, I point out that, th you know, the old language of saying, you know, people are brainwashed is I think very misleading. And it's, it's also very condescending of people's uh, intelligence. No ordinary lives are ever ordinary. You know, every life is different and quite complicated and people do think and they have um, burdens and priorities in life. They have children and they have a job to hold down or they have to deal with unemployment or what have you. Uh, so um, what I try to do in the book is to try to get at how that um, complicity actually happens. And I point out that it's pretty complicated. You know, there's a lot of bellyache. Bellyaching happens widely throughout the new despotisms, as happens under democracies. And the new despots actually like bellyaching. You know, the bellyacher is someone moaning about, you know, the powerful and the rich and, you know, we're all getting screwed. Um, and does nothing. Uh, as the joke about Putin's Russia says, you know, at that point after belly aching, you know, reaches for another packet of cigarettes and, and you know, has a half liter of vodka. Um, just, and, and just, you know, bad mouths those who rule. A lot of that happens. But here we return to the point about the the, the learning um, uh, mechanisms of these despotisms. You know, those who rule try to seduce people. Don't think of these despotisms as systems um, of repression, of rule through the fist. That happens if you protest against or if you try to buck the system. But what these, the secret of these new despotisms is that they try to win the loyalty of their subjects. And they do that through a whole variety of uh, techniques, partly entertainment, um, partly, um, you know, listening to people's grievances. Uh, uh, in Vietnam, there are early warning detector uh, systems, you know, that, that, that enable people to actually protest against the regime and to demand that you know something be done locally. You know the pothole in this road is 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 killing us. Um, fix it, or else. Uh, so it, it's it, you know there is active complicity. There 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 is a willingness to to um, of subjects to give themselves to the regime, and that is fed very often by the sense that their lives have been improving. You know, Chinese people, if you, if you sample the middle class, it's at least 300 million, could be 400 million growing uh, fast. And if you sample opinion, um, you will find overwhelmingly that, um, th that Chinese uh, people in this middle class think that their lives have improved compared with their parents. Um, they can go shopping. They don't feel fear. Uh, they, they feel that they have dignity. And of course, in the present period, they point to the United States and say, who would ever want a kind of, you know, ruler like that? Or who would ever want that kind of, you know, so-called, you know, liberal democracy? So um, th these are systems of voluntary servitude. Uh, helpful, of course, is the lack of open flows of information. Um, this gaslighting shouldn't be understood as, as brainwashing. It's rather that that gaslighting 
um, produces silences about things. There's no, there's no discussion of uh, Navalny, you know, Alexei Navalny uh, in official Russian media or very limited treatment of it. And I think as we, as we speak, they're, you know, still trying to work out exactly what happened and, you know, it, it seems fairly obvious he was poisoned. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, a combination of silence and, you know, simple lies um, and bullshit. Bullshit is a technical term here yeah, uh, to describe a kind of media, you know, reporting that uh, tries to set aside any considerations of veracity, you know, that truth and, and, and falsity don't matter. It's just storytelling, you know, like the bullshitter who just talks and tries to persuade you that he is a you know good guy. Well, these regimes do a lot of that. Um, and then there are these circuses and the bread that is given up. Not unimportant for understanding how these despotisms work, uh, Tory, is that all of them practice um, to a greater or lesser extent patronage, state patronage. You know, 50% of the Russian population's daily life uh, is directly dependent on state spending. In China, two-thirds of GDP is um, uh, redirected through state institutions. Hence, you know, the massive expansion of um, university education. Hence, the beginnings of a pension system. Hence, the um, attempt to build the universal health care basic uh, healthcare system. So these are not uh, kleptocracies, as the, uh, some uh, writers uh, say. They, they don't simply grab and steal from their plundered, you know, impoverished um, uh, subjects. They actually uh, are very well aware of the importance of state patronage, of, um, of forms of state welfare. In Singapore, periodically, um, individual citizens are granted a rebate on GST. You know, it's a lump sum payment that you get. Um, and that makes you feel as though the state is actually, uh, you know, uh, concerned about your, your welfare, even though you don't have any power to change things ultimately, because it is, in the case of Singapore, it is a one-party uh, 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 despotism. Uh, and that story can be told, I think, in practically every one of these um, despotisms. And that includes Erdogan's Turkey. Um, viewers and listeners might not know that under his rule, uh, shopping malls, the number of shopping malls has increased by eight times. You know, so, so the idea is, um, look, we take care of you. Um, uh, we're expanding the size of the middle class. Uh, there might be um, some present difficulties, but, you know, do go shopping, you know, um, you know exercise that, that free choice as a consumer. You know, so these are not um, fascist regimes that terrify people, uh, that rule through the mass ordering of people, and they're not totalitarian uh, fascist uh, systems in another sense, they don't, they don't require mass mobilization, you know, permanent public rallies coming out in large numbers on the streets. The ideal citizen, the ideal subject, is someone who actually doesn't give um, tuppence about who rules, uh, who's preoccupied with their lovers and their household, their children, their work. Um, their local, uh, uh, you know, institutions, and they're happy for others uh, to rule. Mm -hmm. And um, in that sense, you know, these regimes destroy the, the, the ethos of democracy. If democracy means restraint of arbitrary power, preventing its monopoly and abuse, because citizens take um, an interest in public affairs, well, then these despotisms actually uh, slowly destroy that whole principle. And in this sense, they're fake, or what I call phantom democracies. There's an interesting, um, not, not contradiction, but I just want to tease out how, so the perfect citizen is complacent, doesn't care, is, I guess, self-involved, isn't looking outwards. 
Um, they're, and yet su these... they're subjects, not citizens. Yeah, subjects. Voluntary servitude, it's such a great phrase. But at the same time, these despots, they kind of just want to be liked. You know, they want to, they want people to just kind of think they're cool. And so talk me through, I think there's a story in there about one leader who, you know, likes to get photographed watching the football. Um, you know, I guess that they, they have these kind of personas that they create because they actually have an ego problem there. When I, I think we would have thought of them as cold hearted psychopaths, but they also kind of want to be liked. Yes they, yes, they do, and uh, that particular character is uh, none other than Viktor Orban uh, in Hungary. Um, if uh, those listening and watching are sort of unpersuaded uh, about, you know, the threats of this new despotism, think on this for a minute. Hungary, inside the European Union, um, had a constitutional power sharing democracy with an active civil society, a multi-party system, relatively free media, an independent uh, judiciary, and so on. Uh, it took um, around 10 years for Orban, by winning elections in the name of the Hungarian people, uh, to actually destroy um, those flanking power checking and balancing institutions. Judiciary tamed, parliament tamed, party uh, is, is basically in his pocket. Um, destruction of civil service expertise um, and attacks on civil society, attacks on those who don't belong, Jews, um, Muslims, uh, outside foreigners and so on. And all uh, done with great admiration for Putin. So, you know, you can transform a democracy uh, quite quickly into a despotism. Something like that is going on in the United States, and it's also going on in India and uh, possibly in places like Poland. So um, I think that uh, this, uh, th this dynamic, you know, is, is really... Uh, to be understood, and one of its key features, as you say, is that those who rule, you know, want to be liked and loved by the people. And how do they do that? Well, um, they all, at one point, I say, you know, they, 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 they do the catwalk, they do the Dolce Gabbana catwalk, you know, that they, they, they operate in politics thanks to their media apparatus. They, 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 they act as if they're constantly 24 seven performing on a public stage. Um, they want to be men typically uh, of the people. Uh, they want to win uh, loyalty. They, they want to produce voluntary servitude. They want to be seen as um, rulers who care for their people. And so this all sounds familiar uh, to us, you know, when we think about parties and politicians and how they operate in, in this uh, media environment. So, you know, Xi Jinping um, uh, visits a bun shop and surprises everybody by humbling himself to come and eat buns, uh, uh, steam buns in, in the shop. Or, um, you know, is photographed riding a bicycle with his daughter. Or on foreign visits, you know, he and Peng Yuan, um, uh, the, the, the first first lady of China. You know, the whole thing is a big media show. And why did they do this? Well, I suggest in the book, um, here's a surprising thought, that actually these rulers are more skittish than uh, most people know. Uh, by that I mean, they are aware uh, of, of their vulnerability. That they, they, they know that it's dangerous at the top. You know, they fear plotters, they fear enemies hidden uh, within the upper structures. And of course they fear um, public revolts, uh, Hong Kong style public revolts. And therefore, uh, to deal with their skittishness, uh, to somehow camouflage their skittishness, skittishness they, 
I think, act as if they are men of the people. They are, in this sense, the new despotisms are all forms of um, state-managed populism. You know, it's a, it's, there's, a, there's this constant um, media output um, in which they play the role of, uh, of um, leaders of the people who uh, are for the welfare and the improvements of the lives of the people. But of course, um, there isn't truly uh, speaking public opinion. There are no open public spaces where you know people can assemble freely and criticize uh, the regime. If people try to do that, then um, that's the point at which uh, the chicken is killed, you know, to scare the monkeys. Indeed. Now, John, unfortunately, we are starting to run out of time, but I, I kind of want to leave everyone on a bit more of an up note. <laughs> you, you warn in the book that this kind of despotism could be the future of democracy, but sure. there are other options. So give us a quick overview of what something like a monetary democracy might look like. Well, about optimism and pessimism, uh, I mean, I think uh, in the strange Shakespearean times, uh, Tori, I think um, pessimism is uh, not only unhelpful, but it's dogmatic. You know, the pessimist is someone who says, everything is going to the dogs, everything is racked and ruined, there's no hope. Um, when you think about it, uh, it's a point made by Rebecca Solnit, uh, the American uh, uh, writer. Uh, she points out that, you know, every, every pessimist is a dogmatist. You know, they know uh, what um, is going on in the world. And I, I think, you know, anybody who has an affection for democracy should be more skeptical and, and more open-minded and, and more cautious. Optimists, on the other hand, um, in this period, blind optimism, you know, is just bloody foolish. Uh, there are so many weird things going on and a lot of bad things are going on that blindly to believe that it will all work out well, uh, this I uh, don't buy either. In my work over the years, um, probably it has South Australian roots ultimately. I describe myself as a possumist. Uh, <laughs> it's a joke. It's an in-joke partly because possum in Latin is I can, I can do. You know, uh, a possumist is, is, is pragmatic, always looking for ways to improve things, uh, given what we have now. And, of course, a possum is um, a very clever animal. It can pretend to be dead. It can fly between trees. And cleverness is, is certainly what we need. So I'm a, a, a possumist in this uh, period. Um, I think that um, uh, I have no crystal ball. Um, none of us do. Uh, the future is, you know, an unsent text message. It's um, uh, a chapter or a paragraph not yet written. Uh, but it seems to me that um, this is a period in which um, being a possumist, paying attention to big things that are going on in the world is really important in order that in our daily lives, we um, protect those whom we love, um, we care for, for, for people, we don't put up with uh, nonsense and gaslighting, and we don't put up with politicians and governments um, who uh, try to boss and bully us. And we certainly don't put up with bossing and bullying uh, in you know, our workplaces or in um, our uh, local communities. So that's, I know, um, a big ask. But here we come, perhaps, uh, Tori, to the most basic question of all, which is, you know, what's so good about democracy? Why don't we just um, follow the, you know, the, the, the Chinese model? I mean... This is a serious question that's posed in Myanmar, in Pakistan, uh, in plenty of African countries. You know, um, the Chinese do development. They can build high-speed uh, trains. Um, they could build a high-speed train between Melbourne and Sydney and Brisbane, you know, much faster and cheaper than, than we could ever do it locally. So, you know, there is a definite attractiveness 
to this new despotism. But I think um, here we come back to the very basic fundamental question. I tried to write about it um, over many years. You know, what's so good about democracy? Well, um, it's not that um, there are free and fair elections. Um, that's not, that's only the beginning of, of the story. It's that ultimately democracy is the way of handling power, a way of living that is the best weapon we've ever invented so far for dealing with um, power that is abusive. So I have a kind of precautionary understanding of what democracy is. Democracy stands for equality of people. It doesn't like um, uh, kings and queens. It doesn't like people who are arrogant or institutions that behave as if they are some substitute for God. No, democracy is about the equalization of power. It is about dignity. It is about treating people as our equals of, uh, with respect. Uh, and in this respect, the great weakness of um, these new despotisms is that there's just too little of democracy in that sense of um, uh, uh, living according to the principle of equality and not putting up with um, foolish, arbitrary power. I say towards the end of the book that despite all of their resilience, despite the, the welfare um, payments they make, despite the hiding away of violence, despite the fact that they are regimes that act as if there is rule of law, despite all of that, the great weakness of these despotisms and the great advantage of resilient democracies is that resilient democracies have a way of preventing uh, abuses of power and of remedying abuses of power and, and, and doing so openly. It is just possible, we don't know, that um, surprise, surprise developments will turn out up to the Achilles heel of these despotisms. An example, an election went wrong in Belarus. Um, there is talk of this being a women's revolution. Uh, I, I don't know whether viewers and listeners have noticed this, but women are at the forefront of this refusal of the power of Lukashenko, saying he's a corrupt despot, um, he's fiddled this election, and we're not having it because it's an insult to our dignity as equals. And, um, you know, it's a corrupt regime where you have abused your power by stealing wealth and, and manipulating us, and your time is up. You have to go. That dynamic um, has surprised Lukashenko. We will see what happens. Um, you know, um, he's seen with um, an automatic rifle in public. Um, cheering on his supporters saying, we'll deal with them. Well, it may be that it all ends very unhappily in um, Belarus. Uh, I would say the pestilence rocked uh, the Chinese regime initially. Um, a meltdown of a nuclear reactor. Um, revelations about uh, the despoliation of you know, an environmental area, a poisoned river, or poison in um, a food chain. You know, those events uh, can actually accumulate and they can serve to undermine the whole foundations of these despotisms. And they're vulnerable precisely because they don't have enough early warning detectors. They don't have independent um, investigative journalism platforms that could prevent those abuses of power and remedy them uh, very quickly. Well, this is a big um, test that I think democracies are facing, but uh, that's a long-winded way of saying in just a sentence, you know, that democracy has the advantage of um, preventing, when, it, when it's healthy, of preventing um, abuses um, of power, preventing arbitrary power, stopping it in its tracks.
self-correcting mechanism indeed. Yes, and uh, this applies not just to government, it also applies to corporations. It applies also to everyday life. Um, if a man bullies and bosses and threatens a woman with violence, that is unacceptable from the point of view of democracy. If democracy is about equality and dignity and no abuses of power, then democracy also, you know, its spirit uh, has to take root in everyday life. The way we treat children, the way we deal with our biosphere, the way we deal um, uh, 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 with uh, partners and so on, are all, you know, the raw material, the stuff of, of democracy. It's not just up there, you know, um, a, a way of restraining governments or corporations. Beautifully put. Well, Professor John Keane, thank you so much for talking to us about your new book, The New Despotism. Um, and thank you for being part of Just a Thought, a series from the Hawke Centre, the University of South Australia's Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre. Thank you so much. People go out, buy the book, look at all the other stuff is done. And thanks again. It's been my great pleasure, Tori. Thank you very much for your wonderful questions. And I too enjoyed it a lot. I'm glad.